text this morning is coming from Revelation 1, 9 through 20. We're starting a new sermon series today. Um, and it's called, our sermon series is called Dear Church, the Seven Letters to the Churches of Revelation. Let me read you guys, let, read to you guys Revelation 1, 9 through 20. Follow after me. Um, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in, are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to per Pergamum, to and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Lasodia. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, like the one, a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell, fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. And for the mystery of the seven stars that you might that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear God, I just pray that you may open up our ears and our hearts to receive your words, O Lord, and may it encourage us, challenge us, rebuke us, and comfort us, O Lord. And I pray that as we listen to the letters written to the churches, O Lord, may it speak to us as if you are writing them to us. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be holy and pleasing to you. I pray that your gospel may be preached, and I pray, O Lord, that your spirit may work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you guys a, a, a quick question. I mean, if you guys could write a letter to the church with all that's going on in this world and all the experiences that you had from maybe childhood um, to now, and, and you could write about your personal experiences, whatever you want, and you knew that these words would have a lasting impact onto the church, what would you guys write? Let me just think about it. If you could write one letter to the church, it's going to be spread out to all the churches. It's probably going to have a lot of influence. What would you write? Would it be words of encouragement? Would it be words of rebuke? Would it be suggestions that you think are desperately needed? Or maybe some of you guys are like, yo, I don't have a clue. I don't, I don't really care, actually. I mean, in one sense, we know that a lot of churches, at least in America, are now kind of on the decline. The older generation in most churches are dying off. Um, if you walk into any one of the churches, most likely more than, definitely more than half of them are all going to be of old age. Younger churches like ours are not that typical. And it was a chilling reminder last week when Pastor Rob was up here and he was like, you know, the church is always just one generation away from extinction. And it's true. Just one generation. And of course, we can come up with a number of different reasons why trends take place. We're like, hey, times change. Technology changes. Values change. You know, people and their mindsets change. We certainly all have our own criticisms of both the church and maybe even our changing culture. But then in another sense, if you really think about it, there are so many other churches that are hustling to live out their calling faithfully. There are a lot of new churches being started. There's young pastors stepping up, young church members and young church leaders who are doing whatever it takes to get the name of Christ out there. And the church is certainly not dying in a global sense. In fact, there's so much more to be encouraged by. Let me ask you, though. I mean, if you could write one letter from all your personal experiences, from your childhood and all, what would you write? What would you write? You know, we're starting a new sermon series called Dear Church, and it's the seven letters to the churches of Revelation. 
And, you know, I, I, I've come across this because I was, I was constantly thinking, you know, every time there's a, a, we end a sermon series, we start a new one, I, I begin to have a lot of anxiety. I'm like, oh, what do I preach on? What do, what do I do it on? At one point, I, th- I thought I was going to preach on the Ten Commandments and had somebody, like, you know, make a, a poster for it and all because I was reading through Exodus at that moment. I mean, starting a new sermon series is probably the, one of the toughest things because it sets the spiritual course of the church for the next several uh, weeks. And as you guys know, we just ended a sermon series in the, the five E's of our church reminder where we talked about our core values and, and you know, how it's connected to our mission um, to love like Christ and to live out his great commission. But in reflection of these five things, I kept asking God, I'm like, yo, I, I do say yo to God, actually. <laughs> I'm like, what do you want me to preach? What should I preach next to the church? What do you want as a church for us to hear? How do, you, how do you want us to be shaped? What do you want us to know? What should we focus on? And I often pray to someone, Lord, just drop, a, drop something, like talk to me or something, write an email to me or something, let me know, you know? And in praying over this, I also stumbled upon the book of Revelation in my quiet time. I'm actually a part of two Bible plans right now, one that was ending with our, our elder training, which I just uh, finished recently, and also a new one with our discipleship group. That's why I'm like at both ends of the Bible. But as I came across Revelation, I was reminded that this is what the book is actually about. It's a letter to the churches written by Jesus Christ himself through John. My gosh, I mean, I've been praying for a voice, but this letter has already been written. And I was like reading through this. I'm like, wow. I mean, the book of Revelation starts by saying this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This means these are words that were planted into John from Christ himself of things that are things that are happening at the moment and things to come. This means that this letter was revealed to John from Christ himself. And it's a word for us. You know, now, when reading the book of Revelation, it's easy to get sidetracked by a lot of different poetic language and symbolic language and imagery. Sometimes people say, you know, they're, they're so scared to read the book of Revelation because it's talking about the end times, right? I mean, how many of you guys kind of, like, feared reading this book? You don't want to read it by yourself, especially at night. And, you, and Yeah, you guys are all too tough, right? You guys aren't, aren't shook by stuff like that. But, I mean, there's talk about the lakes of fire, the seven-headed red dragon that is out there to devour people. It talks about a beast that is like a leopard, but it's not just any leopard. It has the mouth of a lion and claws like, like bears. And, and, you know, it's talking about this epic fight between God and, and Satan, and, and, and not to mention the great plagues of Armageddon. It's kind of like, you know, it reflects kind of the plagues of Egypt. And the world is ending, and people have nightmares reading about it. I mean, so many of these depictions have been used in movies as well, right? I mean, every time the world is about to end, they use the word Armageddon from the Bible, which is actually just a battlefield back then. And you've seen and heard numerous people attempt to make sense of all these images, and people are really creative in their interpretations. And, you know, all throughout history, there have been many of those self-proclaiming prophets who always try to guess when the world is going to end by reading this book. And they look at things going on and they look at any person, movement, or, or even nation, and they're like, oh, that's the Antichrist. It's the proof of the world ending. But people have been saying this over and over again. And, and I kid you not, there's every, every now and then I'll get an email saying, hey, uh, Pastor Paul, did you check this like, YouTube clip out? Like, are we going to get the mark of 666 on our forehead and this computer chip in our arm? And I'm just like reading this. I'm like, dang, like, people get real creative, you know? And I want to make the case that this is probably one of the most misunderstood and abused books of the Bible, where people spend so much time trying to figure out how the world is going to end. They seek for secret codes and they hidden messages within it. I mean, it's really dangerous to take the Bible out of its original context. Our imaginations go wild. Because at the end of the day, this book, Revelation, was not written to predict the future or to know when it's all going to come to an end. Sure, it lets us know that there is an end, But it's not for us to figure out. I mean, even Christ, all throughout his gospel, says, hey, no one knows. No one knows. No one can know. Only the Father knows. So don't get caught up in trying to figure it out. Just be be prepared all the time. But at the end of the day, this book, this book from beginning to end is all about Jesus. It really is. I mean, the entire Bible from its core is from beginning to end is about Jesus. Therefore, this book is about Jesus, given to us from Jesus. And in this book, you find a lot of things, right? It points to Jesus' love for the church. It points to Jesus' power over the world and everything in it, including his enemies. It points to Jesus' victory over evil and sin. It points to Jesus being on the throne of his kingdom that will reign over this world. It points to him coming to judge the world at the end, giving grace to those who put their faith in him. I mean, this book, at the, at the end of the day, was written 
to show how life up to the very end, regardless of all the things that might come, regardless of all the hardships that we face in life, regardless of all the evil that we might experience, all the pain, all the suffering, the corruption that we see, the terror that we see, the fear that we might have in our hearts, all the stuff that we wish wouldn't be in this world will be overcome and Jesus will bring his justice, peace, love and joy at the end and evil will be crushed. I mean, the book of Revelation was not really written to bring fear. It was written, not written to give us a preoccupation of what is to come but it was written specifically for the church as a letter from Jesus Christ to give the church hope in him alone, an assurance, assurance of his sovereignty. It is written to tell us that the world is in his hands. It is written to tell us that there's nothing to fear, that we don't have to walk around uncertain of the future, but we can walk around confident because of the victory that we have in him. This is why at the end it says this in verses 17 to 18. It says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. Christ is reminding the church that he has already conquered death. He has the keys of Hades and death, meaning that he has the keys to get out of it, the keys of life. He died but has resurrected and lives forevermore. And that same power is given to us. And our end is secure in him. Therefore, live in that victory. I mean, if you guys read Revelation chapter 1, we get the entire scope of what the entire book is about. And in today's sermon, it really just serves as an introduction before we go exploring into the, into the first three chapters of this book. I mean, we're not going to go through the entire book, but I'm just going to focus on the first three chapters because they were specifically written um, to the seven churches of Revelation. And my hope is that we as a church will read these letters as if Jesus is speaking them to us personally. And I hope that we are challenged as a church. I hope we're encouraged. Sometimes I hope we're rebuked and also comforted. And in this introduction, I just want to go over just three simple things. One, who the author is. Two, who he is writing to. And three, who he represents. And this is all going to fit into like what that actually means for us. But let me introduce you guys who the author is. Let's read verses, uh, verses 9. It says this. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the, patient endu- and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on the account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I mean, first off, we know that this, Bible, the, the, this is a revelation from Christ, but he gives it to a guy named John for him to write. And see, John is one of the apostles of Jesus. He is one of the originators. He's one of the disciples that were with, God, with Jesus almost from the beginning to the very end. Um, he must have been really close to, close to Jesus because all throughout the book of John, it talks about him being the beloved disciple. Sometimes I'm like, yo, like John must have had some like real, real pride about it because, you know, he calls himself the beloved disciple for writing his own book, right? And I'm just like, all right, a little arrogant, but all right, he's a beloved disciple. disciple. He's a guy that stood by um, Jesus' mother as Christ was dying on the cross, he was one of the guys, along with Peter, that ran to the empty tomb. And, and, you know, after witnessing that he's not there anymore, he's one of the ones that were there the entire time. I and mean, he was with Jesus through thick and thin. And John had matured a lot up to the point of writing this book. When John first joined the ministry of Jesus, he joined for all the wrong reasons. I mean, he thought that following Jesus was going to be a road to fame. He pictured a heroic savior or a messiah. If you guys didn't know in this, this time period, the, Jew, the Jews were ruled over by the Romans and they're constantly waiting for someone, a political leader to step up. So they're all waiting for this like Dwayne Johnson or Vin Diesel type of guy to come in to, 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 you know, to, with all of its muscles and with all the big weapons to win over their enemies and they're going to be on the top again. So all throughout the Gospels, you see even John specifically, he keeps asking Jesus like, hey, when you rise to power, Yo, can I be, can I be your right-hand man? Can I be a with, with you? Can I be second in command? Can I get the glory with you? Where Jesus would answer, John, you have no idea where, where, where I'm headed. You, you have no idea the road I'm about to take. It's not the political glory, but a road to the cross. And up to this point, John really has seen it all. You know, this book was written right around 90, 90 AD. And this is pretty significant because about 20 years ago, in 70 AD, this is when the temple was completely destroyed. This is the second temple, actually, during Jesus' time period where Jesus goes in and all that. That temple was completely destroyed. I mean, this is the, the, 
the, the nightmare of what John had envisioned at first, but completely destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were already slaughtered by this point. I mean, this is far different than what he had anticipated. I mean, and not, not to mention, this is during the time period where um, I think towards the end of Emperor Domitian's, Domitian's reign, this is the guy that took over right after Nero, and these two emperors were, were probably the, the two most famous guys that led the assault against the Christian church. Jews were being killed, Christians were being killed, and they're being killed left and right. They were thrown into the Colosseum to be killed by wild animals and gladiators, and they were burned at the stake. And for John right now, by the time of this letter, all the other apostles, all of his buddies were already dead. He's actually the only one of the apostles who was not martyred for the faith. And even as he's writing this letter, it says that he's on the island of Patmos, which was kind of an island designed to be a prison. It's kind of like Alcatraz or Rikers Island, made for the worst criminals. And here he is because he was preaching about Christ. You know, back in the day, when I, when I heard that John was the only guy that wasn't killed for his faith, I was like, yo, he got it easy, man. John got it easy, but I think he had it the worst. You live long enough to see all that going on, and now you're on an island that makes you, makes you, you know, do physical labor. He's about 90 years old by this time. I mean, this is a really dark time for the church where many churches, although a lot more were faithful, a lot were also deflecting. Christians began to leave the faith, or at least they were trying to keep it secret. Others were compromising with other religions. Some were trying to be, more, trying to be faithful as well. But, I mean, this is going on. And at this point, John receives a word from Jesus to give to the churches who are in desperate need of a word from God. I mean, these were the first churches of the world, really. And what we need to realize is that when John is writing this book of Revelation, using all that imagery and beasts and dragons and the mark of the beast, he's using imagery more or less to talk about what is going on at that time period and what will continue on throughout history. See, the battle was already going on, and John knew that it would continue on to the end. You know, for instance, the mark of the beast, right, 666, was actually kind of a code name to talk about Nero, you know, Emperor Nero. When you write that in Aramaic, the value can be 666 using Hebrew numerology, which was used back then to, to kind of, you know, talk trash about the emperor and not get caught. So he's writing all these things, talking about the times that are going on at that moment while letting people know that God is in power over all of that, all of what's going on in the present moment and all that will go on in the future as well. And this is what John is writing to. But who is John writing to? I mean, we already mentioned that he's writing to the churches of, uh, of Revelation, right? Let me read to you guys verses 10 and 11. It says this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, send it to per Pergamum, send it to Thyatira, send it to Sardis, send it to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. See, this letter is addressed to the first century churches in the seven cities in the Roman province of Asia. Let me show you just a quick map just to get you an idea of where this is talking about. See, Patmos is that little, like, pink pink color and then you know all the churches are kind of in this roundabout way and he ordered him ordered them on the way that you know like a mailman would drop it off right he's ordering in that that type of pattern now in the face of all that is going on this is church what do you call it uh john through jesus christ is talking about the different issues that are going on you know i want to encourage you guys to read through chapters two and three over this next week just to get a glimpse of what we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks um, even in your small groups today, talk about it with your small groups just so that you guys can get familiar with it. But he starts with Ephesus, right? Ephesus, although they were being faithful and they were enduring, they were also abandoning the first love that they had. If you guys can go to the next slide, it, it kind of breaks it down to what the churches were facing. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, they were getting tired. They were getting worn out. They were losing sight, forgetting about the first love that they had. You know, it's kind of like marriage after seven years, right? It doesn't look like what it used to look like before. There's a jadedness that happens. You go through the persecutions of children beating you up. I've got a mark on my face because of my child, actually. And different things that, that life brings. And he's saying, hey, wake up. Don't abandon your first love. Smyrna, God knew that there was more suffering coming for the church. So he encouraged them not to fear it. I mean, I, th I think there's a realness, right? The world is not easy. It, hardship will come. Don't fear it. Don't run away from it. 
Don't think that everything is falling apart. Don't think that you're doing something wrong because you're facing it. I mean, a lot of people, whenever they face something hard, they're like, oh, did I do something wrong? No, this is, it's life. He's saying, hey, expect it. Don't let it surprise you. It's a part of the growing pains. Therefore, John writes to encourage the church to look forward to it and to keep the sight of the future blessings that come through it. Pergamum, differently, was led astray by false teaching. You know, there were many different religions during that time period that were promoting different things. In this one particular, they talk about a, a god named Baal, which was, you know, they're like, he's like, worship me and I'll give you good things. False teachings were going around, which certainly looked good during times of trouble. People were selling their souls. I mean, it's easy to follow after things when they promise a better life. It's easy to listen to words that give false hope that sound really good, but at the end it amounts to nothing. And John is writing saying, hey, keep focused on the truth. Thyatira was also developing a, a, a habit of tolerating sin. Particularly, they talk about tolerating sexual sins. I mean, they were getting desensitized to it. I mean, sin was so prevalent during that time, like you kind of get used to it. I mean, this is just so true in so many things, right? If you expose yourself to something for long enough, you kind of get used to it. I, I remember as a kid, the first time, I think in middle school, that I cut school and my heart was thumping. I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope I don't get caught. This is not promoting anything for the younger ones in this room. But, you know, I was so scared. I'm like, oh, what if I get called? What if they call my mom? What am I going to do? You know, two years later, I, I perfected my mom's signature, and I was writing notes right from the start. Like, I, I got some other people that I used to cut with me in here. But you get desensitized to it. That's what's going on. People are getting used to it. And then there's Sardis, right? They were becoming idle. Maybe they were scared for so long, they started to get apathetic. And this is one of the scariest places for the church to be. And just like, I don't care. I don't care. Uh, I don't know. You know just, I don't care anymore. This apathy that comes along and John is like, yo, wake up. He's actually clapping, saying like, wake up. Wake up from your spiritual death. Remember who you are. Remember what you receive. Remember your blessings. Get out of your depression. Wake up. You know, Philadelphia is actually really encouraged, man. This is one of the few that he was like, yo, you guys are good. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, yes, Philly. Put one on the map for us, you know, and... But there's real humility in that because he's saying, hey, hold fast. Hold fast. There's good times and there's bad times. Prepare to be faithful when things get harder. But, I mean, it's still a win for Philly. I'll take it. Laodicea, another, another, another city, is told that it's being lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, meaning that maybe they were compromising. Maybe they were holding on to two sides. Maybe they just didn't have passion in anything. Maybe they were just blah. Maybe they were just like Sardis becoming idle. I don't know. But this lukewarmness was not good. In fact, our scripture says that God would rather spit it out. But you see, when I was writing, reading these letters, I mean, it's not hard to see how churches can fall into some of these pitfalls. I mean, it's not hard to see ourselves in these. And I'm sure if you are able to, I'm sure as we're talking through this, you're able to imagine and reflect even in your own mind of different circumstances of these. But what was so encouraging to me is this is that regardless of these weaknesses, the letters refer to the churches as lampstands. You are lampstands. In fact, verses 20, it says this, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. See, angels of the seven churches or the stars are basically talking about the leaders of the church, those that are, are representing it. And he's also talking about the lampstands being the seven churches. He's saying, you are still the light of the world. No matter how dirty the lampstand is, you're still a lampstand in my hands. And the right hand is actually also pretty significant, saying that God is using us in his hands, in his right hand. You are representatives. You are the church, your beloved. The weaknesses don't change your standing with God. He's not going to throw you out. I mean, he's talking about all these things. And in that love, God calls out those whom he loves. I mean, this, you know, a lot, a lot of these letters, I mean, it, it talks, it warns them, it rebukes them. And Christ even disciplines them. But this is all a sign of love. I mean, if you guys ever want to read an awesome, awesome chapter on what godly discipline is or, or what it means to be disciplined by God, read Hebrew 12, Hebrews chapter 12. And it talks about how God disciplines those he loves. And if you don't feel that discipline in your life of him molding your life, it means you might be an illegitimate child. He's saying, no, God loves and he chastises, chastises every son whom he receives. I mean, parents in this room, I mean, how hard is it 
to discipline your child. I mean, playing with your child is hard too. I, I know that. But disciplining, it takes another work. I mean, grandmothers, right? They, they enjoy their kids all the time. But it's because they don't have to discipline them, you know? It's like, if they don't listen, you just give them some candy, throw them an iPad, and you're good. You're like the best grandma, you know? But disciplining is hard work. It requires a lot of energy, and it requires a lot of love. And this is what these letters are. See, Christ is in love with his church, and he will do anything for it. He calls us our bride, and he will put his life on the line for it. Last point, who does he represent? You know, I'm, I, you know I'm like, I, like I mentioned this from the beginning. I mean, this is not really a cliffhanger, right? I already gave it away. Everything is about Jesus, everything. I mean, check this out. Let's just read, um, read this description that, that, that John has envisioned. It says this, verses 12 through 16. Then I turn to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. Son of man was described as Christ all throughout the Bible. And it says, is clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. His right hand held, he held the seven stars and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. For you guys are like, what the heck does that all that mean? But you, you got you to picture the moment. See, John is like picturing a moment where he looks at his side and all of a sudden he sees this gorgeous of a man or gorgeous of a person shining at him. I mean, it doesn't sound so beautiful when we just read it, but this is really that moment where you walk into a room, and I'm just going to picture myself as a lady, that man in shining armor, that, that, that gorgeous man walks into this room, and you're like, oh, my gosh, that's it. That's it. You know, it's funny. I met with a newly married couple this week, and she was describing how when she first met her man, she was like, oh, my God, I need to get him. That's it. But this is the feeling that this is talking about. I mean, right now, John sees this man, and he's like, yo, this is it. This is the moment where the world is stopping, the man is glowing, your heart is melting, and the groom that you've been waiting for your whole life walks into that room. Everything goes slow-mo. See, John is seeing the seven churches or the lampstands that's standing there, and Jesus in all of his glory is standing in the middle of them, the groom that is holding it down for them. When it's talking about wearing a robe, it's talking about a royalty that he has. He's the king of the world. He has the power of his kingdom at his feet. He has everything. His hair being white. I mean, you know, as you get older, your hair grows white. It's referring to the wisdom that he has. He knows everything. He knows what to do. He knows the decisions to make. He has the wisdom of everything. His eyes were like that of a flame. You know what this means? It means he can see through your soul. He knows you. Not just on the outside, but inside of you. He sees you. He understands you. He feels you. He knows all your weaknesses. He knows your sins. Therefore, his judgment is never off. He sees you. His feet like being burned, burnished bronze and refined. This actually means two things. One, it says that he is refined. He's holy. But then it's also saying he's strong. Bronze was one of the strongest metals during that time period. So it's always using that kind of depiction. It's basically saying, yo, he's innocent and powerful. I mean, best of two worlds, right? And lastly, it says his voice, like the roar of many waters, he speaks with authority. In fact, out of his mouth is like a double-edged sword. He speaks truth. It has weight. They're authoritative, and it makes things happen. And the reason why Revelation chapter 1 spends so much time talking about Christ in this type of manner is because if you meet Christ first, if you meet a person like this first, the rest of the books of Revelation, right, with all the dragons and all those things begin to look very, very small. The thing is, everybody skips the first chapter and they go, they go to the rest of it and they're like, oh, I'm so scared. But no, you got you to gotta see this first. When you see, meet Christ first, everything else begins to look so small and you begin to walk with confidence throughout the rest of the book. You know, the other day I was at a, I was at a park. I was at, um, what's that, Parkside Park with a big castle and all that. My daughters are, are just three and two right now and and you know they're, they're relatively small compared to like the 10 year olds that are running across the entire place and not to make 10 year olds sound like they're like the devil and like the things like that but you know they, they like knock them down there stuff like that so 
you know, I remember they were about to walk up. They get scared. They run back to me. You know, I'm not that big. I'm pretty short as a guy, but it doesn't matter. I'm still bigger than them. So, you know, I'm holding their hands, walking, and just looking at the confidence they have whenever I lift them up through hard parts and, and holding their hands, even though the big kids are walking by, I imagine that's what it feels like, right? That confidence when you're walking with Christ. That confidence that you have when you, have, when you, when you meet a guy like this, wearing a robe, white as snow, eyes like fire, burnished bronze, all these things, suddenly everything else feels small. But that's the feeling when you have Christ. Suddenly the dragons and all that doesn't feel so big anymore. The beasts are just so small. You know, fairy, tale, fairy tales is something of the Western world. It's influenced, it's influenced by imageries of the Bible. I mean, anybody that knows the history of fairy tales know that everything of the story and the narrative is drawn from the Bible. This is why it's so like close to our heart and we feel warm when we see it. I mean, you ever wonder why they got the idea of a fire-breathing dragon? I mean, you don't see them all the time but it's depicted in scripture. And they always point to a, guy, a, point to a person who is a hero. And who is Christ? He's that hero. Guys, he's a prince charming, the groom in pursuit of the bride, who will stop at nothing to win her from the enemy who keeps her captive. I mean, Christ is that archetype that all fairy tales are, are, are mimicking, mimic, mimicking after. And Christ says he loves the church. And you know what the best thing about all fairy tales are? The reason why we can enjoy it it's because we know the ending, right? We can enjoy it because we know the ending. It's not a mystery. This is why we're so drawn to these stories because it, it reflects the one true story that has the ending secure. And because we know the ending, you know, Christ says he is the Alpha and Omega, who is and who was and who is to come. He is the Almighty, the beginning and the end. He's basically saying life can be dark. The world can be a dark place. The church will face its issues. You will face your issues. It won't be perfect. There will be times it fails. Sin will be there. We might get lukewarm. We might be led astray. The world in its fallen state can certainly be evil. But you know what? It's all bright because we know the ending. I mean, if you think about all the fairy tales that we've read, right? Snow White is a very dark show. I mean, the whole, 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 whole fairy tale is about like a queen trying to kill her and keeps trying to kill her. I mean, if there was no prince, I mean, it's a very dark movie. Like, it's, oh man, it's apple and everything. Sleeping Beauty, right? Like, what the heck is the point of a, a woman that sleeps for years and years? She does nothing, you know? Why is she such a big part of this? It's so sad if there's no prince coming. Cinderella becomes an orphan, slave to her stepmother and stepsisters. A horrible place to be at. But why is that whole movie beautiful? Because we know that the prince is coming. My gosh, if the prince wasn't there, these stories would be so sad. But they're not. They're actually pretty bright. Why? Because the prince is coming. You know, the Bible says that Christ is the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and he comes with the authority of the sword. And we as a church is his bride. Even in moments of sinning, falling, and persecution, we see the beauty of it all because we know that Christ has come and he is coming and he has secured the end. You know, the only question I'm going to leave to you guys is, do you have that hero in your life? Do you trust in that hero? Because if you don't, Man, we live in a very sad and depressed world, and it won't be a happily ever ending life. Do you know Christ? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? The Bible promises that if you call upon his name, that narrative of a happy, everlasting ending becomes yours. And all the things that we face in this world, although there are dark moments, it will be seen in a brighter light. I pray that that may be your testimony. Let's pray.